Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. During the past 50 years, numerous advancements in the field of orthodontics have led to sound treatment concepts that allow the orthodontist to achieve a stable and aesthetic result in the most difficult of cases. With a thorough understanding of growth and development, occlusal development, surgical advancements, and sophisticated technical procedures, it is possible to accomplish the commonly accepted orthodontic goals in virtually every case. <clears throat> the common goals are class one molar interdigitation, minimum overjet and overbite, the lower incisor upright over the basal portion of bone, arch symmetry with lack of contacts free of individual tooth rotations and maintaining the lower cuspid width. In the posterior, the root should be parallel, especially in extraction cases at the extraction site. The four mentioned goals lead to stability of the dentition and at the same time improve the profile of the patient. So another goal of orthodontics is to improve the person's facial profile. The orthodontist in recent times has also become concerned with the smile line. <clears throat> when during treatment, if the maxillary molar tooth is extruded, it causes the mandible to rotate down and back, which makes it more difficult to correct a class two malocclusion, and at the same time necessitates uh, extruding the maxillary incisor teeth in order to gain contact, with the result being that the patient has a gummy smile. These goals are good and lead to a stable and aesthetic result, but there is one goal that's conspicuously missing. This is the function between the teeth, the temporal mandibular joint, and the muscles of mastication. The case should be examined from a functional standpoint before treatment, during the diagnosis, <clears throat> during treatment to examine for problems in the occlusion that are making the mechanics not go correctly, and just before finishing the case in order to make sure that the muscles, the joint, and the teeth will be in harmony and problems will not relater, occur later in life. It's easy to talk about function, but it's important to understand exactly what we mean. So the first goal of a healthy, functionally correct occlusion is to have the condyles seated in the glenoid fossae when the teeth are in maximum interdigitation. The condyle should be seated properly, laterally, anteroposteriorly, and superior inferiorly. The second goal for a healthy, functionally correct occlusion would be to have smooth lateral movements. The contacts should be even on the working side, evenly distributed amongst the posterior teeth and the cuspid or 
all the contact should be on just the cuspid tooth on the working side with complete disocclusion on the balancing side. No contacts on the balancing side. The third criteria for a healthy occlusion would be smooth protrusive movements with the guidance on the anterior teeth and no posterior contacts. These models illustrate the contact in the incisor area and the absence of contact in the posterior segments. To illustrate these points, I'd like to present a case that was treated with orthodontic appliances that resulted in discomfort to the temporal mandibular joint. To demonstrate this case, I'd like to show you with a graphic that depicts the relationship between this person's occlusion and the temporal mandibular joint. When the joint is seated comfortably in the glenoid fossa, the teeth are not in maximum interdigitation. However, when this girl brings her teeth into maximum interdigitation, the condyle is not properly seated in the glenoid fossa. To show you the patient and the models, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ed Harriman. This young lady is Marty. She is just about 17 years old. Her treatment started about five years ago in the orthodontic department. And you can see that the original malocclusion was a classic class two division one with a routine pore bicuspid extraction case. The treatment was relatively non-problematical and you can see at the end that the, most of the result was right there where you like to see it. The only problem that we had was at the end is that the centric relation and centric occlusion were not coordinated. You can see by the articulator here, articulated model that back in centric relation that the teeth could not fit together. When we had this problem, Marty, you're, you started having some problem how soon after the bands were off? Right after. Right after the bands were off. Did this increase or did it subside after that? It got worse. It got worse. Marty uh, appeared about six months later and the graduate student and the instructor went up to the occlusion department to see if we could find what the problem was this bite splint was made. And did that take care of your problem, Marty? Yes. And when did you wear the bite splint? At night. At night. The sequence continued with the bite splint for just about a year and a half. Finally, the third molars were removed to see if that was the problem or whether that would alleviate the problem. It did not, and in May of last year, uh, we had another consultation with the occlusion department and it was decided that without orthodontic movement that with centric relation and centric occlusion coinciding that we could not uh, coincide the two arches and relieve the pain permanently. So then finally we took th and made this model or this appliance that you see on the screen. It was made by trimming the model on the, and bending the appliance activated. We actually trimmed the teeth and then made the appliance so it was active. This appliance has been adjusted since then several times and we can see that it had a lot of power into it. But it did the job. Uh, Marty, how long was that? That was in about two weeks before you had the appliance, right? Yes. Or before you had the appliance out. And the appliance in the mouth 
did not cause any problems uh, to Marty. She wore it after the appliance was in. She had some movement. Within two weeks, she had about two millimeters movement from central groove to central groove of the bicuspid area. She had about uh, 1.8 millimeters in the first molar area and two millimeters or 1.2 millimeters in the second molar area. You can see that moved the bicuspids and the molars lingually, and it was a bodily movement, a little tipping, but mostly bodily movement. We were worried about flaring of the anteriors, which did not happen. In flat fact, some of the anterior crowding dissipated with the appliance in. We left the appliance in for a period of about a month. Is that right, Marty? Yes. And we let the occlusion settle after the appliance was out for about another month. And then we did an occlusal equilibration. And we didn't have to do a setup to do it because we just had to grind on the upper left first bicuspid in order to get centric relation and centric occlusion to coincide. Now I'm going to show you Marty's occlusion in the mouth and show you how it looks at this time. Can you turn just a little bit towards me, Marty? Open, please. And now bite together on your back teeth. There we go. And this is her left side, and you can see that the bicuspids and cuspids are tucked right in against the uh, lower bicuspids and cuspids, giving us a good cuspid rise in that area with no, uh, now open please, bite together, turn your head the other way just a little bit. There we go. And the same on this side, and you can see that it's the same as there, giving us a good cuspid rise, and we don't have any balancing or protrusive interferences now at this time. You may find that in cases such as this, that an appliance such as this may not be doing the job for you. You may have to go to complete band up. You may have to devise just a little bit different appliances. This was just a method where we could use the appliance without going to a full band up where the patient really did not want to have a full band up. In some cases you may have to go to a full band up. The main thing that we want to emphasize here is to coincide centric relation and centric occlusion when you are finishing a case. If the first seven goals of orthodontics are not met, we might have minimum change in the profile or possibly relapse in the dentition. But if the eighth goal of orthodontics is not met, it's apt to result in damage to the temporomandibular joint, pain in the musculature, wearing of the teeth, or insults to the periodontium. To demonstrate the damage that it can occur to the temporomandibular joint, I'd like to show you a slide of a cadaver where the joint has been dissected and it shows flattening of the mandibular condyle head and perforation of the meniscus. The typical radiographic picture shows a flattened condylar head with anterior lipping. The guidance for the mandible is with the teeth. If the teeth are in dysfunction, this can cause cramping in the musculature due to uneven contractions. This results in pain and can be very disabling to the patient. Damage may also occur to the teeth. It is felt that interferences in centric relation can trigger bruxism. The damage can also occur to the periodontium. And I might point out that it can occur not only to one single area, but to one or more. It is also, the symptoms also occur in varying degrees of intensity might be mild and not disabling to the patient to actually quite severe.
have been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.